You know, the Bible makes throughout the pages of the Bible some bold claims, doesn't it? It makes bold claims like, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For some people, that would be a bold claim. It says things like, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's pretty big. But do you know, for every bold claim the Bible makes, for every one of them, the Bible backs it up every time. When we come to our Bibles, it says all sorts of things, but we don't take it just in blind faith. It has solid foundational evidence to help us to understand that God means what He says. Another bold claim is found over in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, where the Bible says that it gives us, the Bible gives us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. That's a bold claim. Here in the Bible, I have everything that pertains to how to live and how to live a godly life. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. Does it tell me how I can be saved from my sins? Yeah, it tells me that. Does it tell me how I can worship God acceptably? Yep, it tells me that. Does it tell me how I can do things like pray and talk to God? Yeah, it tells me that too. Does it it tell me anything about relationships? I mean, that has to do with life. Does it say anything about relationships? Oh, yeah. To tell me how to be a good husband or a good wife, how to be a father, a mother, how to be a son or a daughter, a brother or sister. It tells me all sorts of things. Does it tell me how to go through my daily life with people? Does it tell me how to talk to people? Does it tell me how to think? Does it tell me how to behave and to act? Does it, does it tell me how I should treat other people? You go through your Bible and it truly gives us everything that we need to live this life. So let me ask you this question. That being the case, does the Bible have anything to say to us about how we dress? Does the Bible have anything to tell us about how God wants us to dress in this life? And all of a sudden, some of you were with me all the way until we got to that point. And then now you're wondering, I don't know if the Bible really gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness now. You're making me doubt. No. The Bible supplies us with everything that we need in life, including telling us how God wants us to dress. Does God really care? Does He really care how we dress? You figure out the answer to that. Does God really care the way that I present myself to others? And, and, and if He does, does He tell me anything in the Bible about how I am supposed to dress? Does He give me any specifics? And is it really that big of a deal? I don't know if some of you are uncomfortable with the topic being today that we're going to talk about modesty. Maybe you are uncomfortable. I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. Maybe some of you are a little uncertain today about this topic and why it's being discussed. I'll tell you why it's being discussed, because this Bible teaches us about it. And if this pulpit is going to proclaim the full, whole counsel of God, then it's got to talk about everything that the Bible talks about. And it can't leave something out because it might not be something that's popular or comfortable or what some folks want to hear. But I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you to get your Bibles. Don't listen to what David says today. What David thinks, what David has an opinion on, doesn't matter one bit. What this book says, that's what matters. And I want us to get into this book and see what God has to say. Because you see, modesty is something that has been designed by God. Man has had his say about it, but I'm not interested in what man has to say about it. I'm more interested in what does God have to say about this topic. So I want to start by asking you a question this morning. Is modesty required? Is modesty required? Well, let's go to the Bible and allow some divine instructions to be given to us in the Bible and to actually see some divine specifications that God has given to us so that we can see when we get to the end of this particular question that God actually demands modesty. My favorite people in this church are the people who take notes during sermons. You are my favorite people. 
But I'm going to tell you this morning, there's going to be more up here than you can get while we're going through it. And so I'll send you the PowerPoint if you want it. I challenge you to keep up, but it'll be a little hard for you to do it because there's going to be a lot up here today. But you're my favorite people still if you try. Get your Bibles and go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 2 because I want the Bible to teach us today. And I want to go through this passage, and I was amazed this past week that this passage is full of words. I know it's full of words chosen by God. God chose every word that's in the Bible. But it's full of specific words, and every single one of them has a meaning that is particular to this topic of modesty this morning. And so as you look at these verses in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to be in verses 9 and 10, I just want us to kind of look through this and look at every single word as God says, in like manner. And I believe what he's pulling from verse 8 is he's telling those men in verse 8 they're to have holy hands. That's the emphasis. And I believe that's the like manner in verse 9. The holiness that God wants women to have is found in verse 9. He says that the women adorn themselves. The word adorn is a present tense verb, ongoing activity required of God. And the word simply means to arrange, to put in order, to cause, to have an attractive appearance. So it's not just a matter of putting on clothes. It's an intentional act that says, how am I going to put this in a right order in the eyes of God? But what does it say? That they may adorn themselves, the New King James says, in modest apparel. Modest apparel. Some translations may have a, a different word there, but the word modest, you see, means orderly. It means well arranged. By the way, the word adorn and the word modest, they come from a similar root word in the Greek language. And the word, the word for adorn, listen to this Greek word. Maybe you'll get our English word. Here's the Greek word for, for adorn. It's cosmeo. Guess what English word we get? Cosmetics from that. What does that involve? That involves the outward appearance. So here women are to adorn themselves in modest, orderly, well arranged. The ESV has respectable here uh, as its translation. Honorable, decent, appropriate. God says that's how I want women to adorn themselves. But the word apparel doesn't just simply mean clothes. It doesn't just mean put on some threads. It's interesting that even the word apparel itself, specifically chosen by God. By the way, the, the Greek word for the, for the word apparel here, it literally means to let down. That's what the word means. It, means to, it, it literally means let down. Think about those women going out into the fields and pulling up their robes to act like a basket so that they could put the fruit or whatever they were collecting in the field, and they would pull up their robes. And this word literally means, for apparel, let down. What's God telling us? Just by the use of that word. But in English, what it means is keeping something in check, arranging in order, having reserve or restraint, making sure the outward attire reflects the inward character. We're going to come back and talk about that. Every word in these verses was specifically chosen by God. These definitions that I'm putting down here are not David's makeup definitions, so it fits the sermon. These are definitions from Greek lexicons and Greek dictionaries, not mine. These are coming from those scholars who know the Greek language to adorn themselves in modest apparel with, and it may depend on your translation here. The New King James says, with propriety. What does that mean? I love the old American standard that has the word shamefastness. The old King James has the word shamefacedness. We don't use that word, those words, but that's literally what the Greek word means. It means a sense of shame. Think about this in regard to what we wear. That there needs to be a sense of shame to retain the ability to blush as a part even of what we are wearing. Look at, look at the word shamefastness. You, you've heard of somebody being bedfast, right? What's, somebody who is bedfast, that means that they are confined to the bed. Well, what does it mean to be shamefast? It means that I have a modesty that is firmly embedded and confined to my character. And what that modesty does in my character is it prevents me from dressing shamefully. That's what this word means. God chose this word. He chose a word that means reverence and self-respect. It means bashful. It means that it is a shame which shrinks from overpassing the limits of womanly reserve and modesty. What does that mean? 
It means that when individuals get dressed, they don't see how close to the line of immodesty they can be. Shamefastness means they take a step way back from that line of immodesty and say, I don't want to get anywhere close to that. They shrink back from being immodest and wearing something that would be considered in the eyes of God to be shameful. Is, is this, to me, this is, this is just eye-opening that God chose these specific words to use in the context of modesty. With propriety, and the New King James has the word moderation. What does the word mean? It just means a soundness of mind, using good judgment. The ESV has here the word self-control. The New American Standard has the word discreetly. The Greek word means especially, as a, and when it's used as a woman's virtue, it means decency and chastity. Think about God saying, here's the mindset, here's the heart I want you to have when you're choosing what to wear. With propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. What was going on in that day? There was a, a focus on the externals being showy, and here's how, much I can, here's how much I have, and here's what I can do. And God says, no, 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 verse 10. But which is proper. The word proper means to be becoming. It means fitting. Fitting for who? Fitting for a Christian. It's becoming, it's, it's appropriate, it's seemly, it is suitable. Well, proper for what? It's proper for those women who are professing godliness. The word professing means that I've made up my mind to do something. I am declaring something by the way that I am dressing. I am declaring that I have an obligation to carry out a commitment that I have made. Well, what's that commitment? I've made a commitment to God. It is a claim, and the New American Standard has the word claim here instead, to be well accomplished in something, to lay a claim. What am I trying to lay a claim on? What am I saying that I'm striving to be? I'm striving to be godly. I'm striving to live a life of godliness. I am pursuing, I am professing godliness, and that is shown, that is seen in the way that I dress. The word godliness means fear of or reverence towards God. God chose every word here. And he didn't just say, he could have just said dress modestly, period. But he surrounds it by all of these descriptive terms to tell us exactly how serious he is about this matter. And then he says at the end of the verse, through good works. Indicating that that which is external and what others are seeing in our lives needs to be a reflection of that which is internal in our hearts. Those things have got to match. If you go over to 1 Peter chapter 3, we don't see it here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, but in the context over in 1 Peter chapter 3, it has the word chaste that's used over there. And again, that Greek word means to be pure or to be holy, to be innocent, to be modest. Over and over, God chose words with specific meanings to emphasize how serious this matter is to Him. Even if you look up the English word, Modesty in a, in a, just in an English dictionary. You know, and this is what it means, the quality in women of dressing or behaving in a way that is intended to avoid attracting sexual interest. And so as you look at these words, just in this one passage this morning, as we focus in, we read this chapter this last week, and perhaps you thought about those verses as you were going through them, as you think about the words that God chose. He specifically chose these words to emphasize for us that He does not want us to attract attention to ourselves by the way that we dress. But everything that we do, including the way that we dress, shouldn't distract people from Him. He uses and chooses these specific words because He expects modest apparel. He expects modest apparel that comes from and is rooted in a modest heart. I read, I read a lot of commentaries this past week on 1 Timothy chapter 2 just to see what individuals are saying about this text. And there's a lot of interesting things that people, men, have to say about this text in their various commentaries. But can I share with you the best commentary that I read? Here's the best commentary I read on 1 Timothy chapter 2 this past week. It's actually God's commentary. 
on 1 Timothy chapter 2. You might look over at it in 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, you are reading a commentary from God on what we just read from 1 Timothy chapter 2 on this subject of modesty. Where God says in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning of verse 3, Do not let your adornment be focused merely on the outward, the arranging of the hair, wearing of gold, and putting on a fine apparel. But here's the focus it needs to have. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart. Do you see again the connection that God makes between the outward adornment and what someone has on the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit? God says, here's how... I want you to dress. And he gives this commentary and says, it reflects the hidden person of the heart. And so this first question that we asked this morning, is modesty required? Could God have been more open with us? Could he have been more descriptive with us to say, yeah, he absolutely requires it. So somebody says, okay. Well, God requires, he requires modesty, but here's the question. Isn't modesty kind of subjective? I mean, it's just it's kind of, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder kind of thing, right? I mean, it's just, it's just subjective, and it's just based upon what culture you live in, what age you've lived in, and it just kind of, it kind of right? That's what it is? Well, I don't want to give you David's answer this morning. Can we let God provide some instructions here? Can we let God give us some illustrations of what he considers to be modest? Can we let God set the standard? And here's the conclusion we're going to come to, is that when we ask this question, is modesty subjective, we need to see that God actually defines modesty for us. Are you interested in seeing God's illustrations for this? Go all the way back to the passage that was read this morning in Genesis chapter 3. Get your Bibles, go all the way back to the beginning, and go to Genesis chapter 3. Because we're going to look at what happens here in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve. And before we look in chapter 3, I want you to back up just into the last verse of chapter 2. Because chapter 2 and verse 25 gives us a context here. Because it tells us right after God created man and woman, when he had created them, verse 25 says they were both naked and they were not ashamed. That's your context for chapter 3. We miss it when we look only at the chapter division. They were both naked and they were not ashamed. But you get to chapter 3 and verse 6 and what do they do? They sin. And as soon as they sinned, verse 7 says, they knew they were naked. Do you see the contrast? Chapter 2, verse 25, before they sinned, they were both naked, but they weren't ashamed. But now they know that they're naked in chapter 3 and verse 7. And so what do they do in verse 7? They sewed together fig leaves. The New King James says, for a covering, the, uh, the New American Standard has the word loincloths. They sewed together fig leaves and made themselves loincloths. You have the picture? Here's what the Hebrew word for loincloths means. It means something that is like a belt or a girdle or a sash. Yeah, that's a lot of clothes, right? I mean, that's covering a lot. What are they covering in their fig leaves? They're covering the bare necessities is what they're covering with their fig leaves. And so God comes to the garden. And when God comes to the garden, verse 8 says that they hide from... Why are they hiding from God? That's a good question. God asked that question. Would you like to know the answer to why they're hiding from God? Look at what they say in verse 10. I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. Why are they afraid from God? What does he say? We don't have to make up the answer. I was afraid because I was naked. You're not naked. You sewed fig leaves together. You're covering the bare necessities. You've got your girdle on. You've got your belt on. You're covering the private parts. You're not naked. I was afraid. Why? Because in God's eyes, I was naked. No, no, no. You were naked before, but not. No, no, no. He says, I'm still naked in the eyes of God. He's still using that word. And so after God issues the punishments for sin and before he drives them from the garden, what does God do in verse 21? The Lord God made tunics of skin for them, and he clothed them. Clothed? They already have clothes on. They made their own clothes. He clothed them. What they had on was not clothed in the eyes of God. He made tunics for them. The Hebrew word for tunic here means a long shirt-like garment, generally with sleeves, covering from the shoulders down the thighs to the knees. So here's God's designer brand for clothes. 
And God's designer brand for clothes is covering the upper body and the lower body. From the very beginning, God has set the standard. From the very beginning, He set the example. Now here's something I want you to see before we leave this text. Is that God did not put this standard in place and He did not put clothes on them because of the matter of lust. That's something we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. But sometimes we think today, oh, well, somebody's got to dress modestly because somebody else is going to lust after them. That's not what's going on here. This isn't because of lust. This is because of what's right in the eyes of God, period, whether lust is involved or not. Go to the book of Exodus. Go to Exodus chapter 28. And as we go to Exodus chapter 28, I want to continue to think about this question. Isn't, Isn't modesty subjective? Meaning, doesn't it change? Doesn't it fluctuate with culture? I want you to see when you go to Exodus chapter 28 that you are 2,500 years after what we just read. Don't you think style had changed in 2,500 years? Don't you think that modesty standards had changed in 2,500 years? Exodus chapter 28, God is talking to his priest about his priest. By the way, if you're a Christian today, you're a priest in the eyes of God. We'll have a lesson on that next month. But in chapter 28 of Exodus, verse 40, they were to make tunics for the priest. By the way, this is the same word that we just saw in Genesis 3 and verse 21, tunics. Same thing, from shoulders down the thighs to the knees. So that's that's the kind of garment that was to be made for the priest here uh, in uh, in Exodus chapter 28 and verse 40. Why were these these, uh, garments being made? Look in verse 41, to consecrate them and to sanctify them. The garments were made to set them apart in the eyes of God to be right with God. Okay, so they've got this tunic on from shoulders down the thighs to the knee. What does verse 42 say? You shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. What? They're not naked. They've got this tunic on from the shoulders down to... They're good. They're covered. What does it mean when he says you shall make them... uh, Linen trousers. What's going on here? This word trousers, the Hebrew word simply means to cover up or to hide. What is the purpose of this? Look at the end of verse 42. To cover their nakedness, they shall reach from the waist to the thighs. So here was something that was to go on underneath the tunic. Wait a minute. I mean, you've got a tunic. I mean, you're covered up. Why do you need something underneath the tunic? Because if we were to back up into chapter 20 and verse 26, we would see that the priests were not, they were told, don't you climb up the steps to go up to the altar lest your nakedness be exposed. What would happen? Somebody might be able to look up their legs at what was going on. Well, what were they supposed to wear up underneath the tunic so that somebody couldn't look up their legs and see something they shouldn't see? They got to put these loincloths on underneath. Otherwise, in God's eyes, what are they? They're still naked in the eyes of God of God. I want you to think about this. Is this serious to God? Well, look at what he says in verse 43. They need to do this lest they incur guilt and die. (laughs) Sounds pretty serious. God cares what we wear, doesn't he? If he cared what the priests wore in the Old Testament, do you think he cares what priests, New Testament Christians wear in New Testament days? Notice that they needed to be covered so that nobody could see their their various private parts. The job of the priest would sometimes require them to reach up in the air, and God did not want anything exposed when they reached up in the air. Sometimes the job of a priest would involve climbing up something in order to light some candles, and God did not want, while they were climbing up something, for that to expose any part of their body. Can I ask you today, when you lift, when you move, when you sit, when you reach, when you bend, does it expose some things that maybe were not exposed before? That's what God has in mind when He's talking to these priests in Exodus chapter 28. We're going to have to rush through these because there's more that I want to talk about. But if you go over to Isaiah chapter 47, you'll see again 
that God is talking this same terminology, but he's talking about in the, in the, in the relationship to these, these uh, captives, and he talks about in Isaiah chapter 47 that uh, Babylon was going to fall to Persia and that the residents, the citizens of, of uh, Babylon were going to be carried away by Persia. And he says that when they were carried away, that their nakedness would be uncovered in verse 3. Well, what was that going to involve? Verse 2 says it would include the fact that their thighs were uncovered. Included in their nakedness being uncovered in verse 3 is the fact that their thighs were uncovered in verse 2. And so verse 3 says, yes, your shame will be seen. Why? They've still got something up, up top, no doubt, but because, because their thighs have been exposed, God says their shame will be exposed. If you back up into Isaiah chapter 20, in Isaiah chapter 20, we read about the Egyptians and the, uh, the Ethiopians as well, uh, the prophecy about them going into captivity. And it says that when they went into captivity, Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 4, it says that their buttocks would be uncovered to their shame. Obviously, we're talking in some senses a figurative language here, but even in a figurative language, what's God doing? He's saying that when certain parts of the body are exposed, it's naked in the eyes of God. When certain body, parts of the body are exposed, it is a shame in the eyes of God. Notice, let me, before I advance that slide, notice we've advanced another 750 years, by the way. Culture should have changed by now, right? Styles would change, right? I mean, it, 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 but you notice how consistent God has been through all of these years. It hasn't changed. So then you go another 150 years and you get into Ezekiel's day. And Ezekiel talked about when, when God first established Jerusalem as his city there and David conquered and how beautiful it was. And, and he describes it as a young maiden who is growing, but it uses the fact that says that her, that her breasts were there and were growing. But God came along in, in chapter 16, verse 8, and took his wing and covered her. The Bible uses the word nakedness. The exposure, in a figurative sense, but no doubt in a literal sense, the exposure of those body parts in the eyes of God was considered naked. Fast forward another 600 years to John chapter 21. What's the point of all of this? The point of all of this is that here's this question. Is modesty subjective? And that's what some people want to say. It's, well, it's, it's subjective. It changes over time. It changes with cultures. And we just not need to adapt. I want you to see that in the first 4,000 or so years of history... It did not change in the eyes of God. Why would we think it's changed in more recent times? So in John chapter 21, Peter is out in the boat fishing. So this is 4,000 plus years after Genesis chapter 3. And so you need to note that this, the New King James says that he had gone out there, but he had taken off his outer garment. Some of your translations in John chapter 21 and verse 7 talk about he only had his, his undergarment on and he had taken the other one off and he was, your Bible probably has the word naked. Well, he wasn't naked, meaning he didn't have any clothes on. He had some clothes on, but he had that inner garment on. But the word that's used to describe him only having the inner garment on is that he was naked. Well, he's not, he's, he's got, why, why does it use that word? Because this Greek word includes not just not having any clothes on, this Greek word includes the concept of being scantily or inadequately clothed. Think about, why did we read that word nakedness all those times in the Old Testament when there were still some clothes on? Because they were, in God's eyes, inadequately clothed. Peter, what's going on? I am inadequately clothed. He sees Jesus on the shore. And so Peter's going to jump into the water and swim to Jesus on shore. And so what does he do in verse 7? He gets his outer garment, he gets his robe, and he puts it on and then jumps into the water. That's kind of backwards in my mind, right? I mean, if you're going to go swimming, you want less on and not more. Peter's going to see Jesus. He had been with his buddies. But when he's going to be in the presence of God... He wants to be properly clothed. He wants to be appropriately clothed. When are we not in the presence of God today? Peter's story tells us that in order to be with Christ and in his presence, he wanted to have the right clothes on 
and the right amount of clothes on. I want you to see again that even in this context, this has nothing to do with lust. It was not that Peter said, oh, I need to put some clothes on because Jesus might lust after me. It had nothing to do with lust. It had to do with being appropriately clothed in the eyes of God. Is modesty required? God demands it. Is modesty subjective? We're going to talk more about this in just a minute. But just in what we've seen in a 4,000-year history of the Bible here, is modesty subjective? Did it change over time? It remained the same. In God's eyes, in man's eyes, it fluctuated, no doubt. In God's eyes, it never changed. It remained the same. So let me ask you one more question. Is modesty consequential? Meaning, is it that big of a deal? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, is being modest, is dressing modestly, in the grand scheme of things, is it all that big of a deal? I, I I don't want to give you David's opinion. I, I want to show you the importance and the seriousness that God gives to this subject, as if we haven't seen it already. In 1 Timothy ch chapter 2 and, and all these passages we've seen since, as if we haven't seen it already. But what we're going to see is that God demands modesty and God denounces immodesty. With all that we've seen already, don't you know God's serious about this? In Genesis chapter 1, we learn that our bodies are created by God and created in His image. We have been created in the image of God. He has put a spirit within us that no other being on this earth has created in His image. God made our, not just Adam and Eve's bodies, God made all of our bodies. Here's what some people say today. My body, my choice. That's said in a lot of context today, right? My body, my choice. Guess what, folks? It's not my body. This body is not mine. And because it's not my body, it's not my choice. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Bible tells us that our bodies belong to God by right of purchase. Jesus purchased us. They belong to God by right of purchase because he is the one who went to the cross for us. They belong to God by, by right of the fact that He dwells within us. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19 says. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? That belongs to God, not to me. And therefore, when I look at my body, I need to see that God values my body. And He expects me to use my body to glorify Him. Because it doesn't belong to me. His body. His body. His choice. Whatever he wants is what I've got to do in everything that I do, including in the way that I dress. And so as we've seen already from 1 Timothy chapter 2 and from 1 Peter chapter 3, God emphasizes that clothing is, an it is, is, is what identifies on the outside, helps to identify somebody's heart. That's what 1 Peter chapter 3 told us, that, it, 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 that the outward appearance is a representation of the hidden person of the heart. And so both of those contexts, you notice that Paul used the same illustration. And he said, here's a showy person. They're a showy person on the outside. Well, what does a showy person on the outside indicate about their inside? They're a showy person on the inside. They think they're all that on the inside. Well, how do you know they think they're all that on the inside? Because they look that on the outside. That's the illustration that he uses. So some people said, no, 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 no. So those passages, they only have to do with just being showy. Those passages only have to do with just with, with the braided hair and, and the gold and just it's going too much. That's what those, they don't have anything to do with going too less in your clothing, right? No, God has to say every bit of it that we are to dress in such a way that is modest in His eyes at all times. Not too much or too little. Somebody says, well, how do you know that? In Proverbs chapter 7, Proverbs chapter 7, Solomon is warning his son about all sorts of indicators about this adulterous woman. And he says, you need to watch out for her. Don't get near this adulterous woman. So he gives him all kind of signs 
to, to recognize when this adulterous woman is around. And in verse 10 of Proverbs chapter 7, he says, here's this harlot. Well, how am I going to know she's a harlot? Because she's got the attire of a harlot. How can you recognize a prostitute? God says you can recognize a prostitute by what she's wearing or perhaps not wearing. Well, why is she wearing that? Notice the end of verse 10. Because of her crafty heart. Why does a prostitute wear what she wears? Because of her heart. God says what's on the outside and what we wear on the outside is a demonstration of what's on the inside. And so folks, brother and sister in Christ, we need to wear on the outside what professes the godliness that we are pursuing on the inside. When folks see me, they don't need to see certain parts of my body and that be what draws their attention. That's distracting people from seeing if I'm trying to profess godliness or not. My outward adornment needs to reflect my heart. God's modesty as we have seen, is not determined by culture. It does not fluctuate with culture. Culture does not decide what's right or wrong. God decides what's right or wrong in all things. Somebody says, David, you are so naive. Boy, preachers are just naive. They get in their little bubbles and you just don't know the real world, do you, David? David, we live in the sunshine state. We live, in, we live in South Florida. This is the place, David. And, you know, David, you need to understand that things are different down here than they are in, you know, places like Kentucky and other places where they don't have all the sunshine that we've got. And so, you know, we, we've gotten used to the fact down here that we've gotten used to a little bit more flesh down than other places. That, that's, just the, that's just kind of where we live and the culture we live in. You know, there might have been a day that I thought that was a valid argument. But in the eyes of God, there is zero validity to that argument. God says, present your body as a living sacrifice, except if you live in South Florida. Be not conformed to this world, except if you live in South Florida. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may present what is the good and perfect will of God. That's what we're striving for. It's present ourselves to, to be conforming to the will of God, not conforming to the society in which we live. Therefore, it has nothing to do with what people accept or don't accept around. Well, David, David, it used to be that, that what was considered uh, uh, you know, modest was clothing that covered up the ankle. So it, was Im it used to be immodest for, for ladies to even show their ankles or their calves. Yeah, it used to be. In man's standard. I'm not here trying to say that man's standard hasn't fluctuated. But the Bible says, we saw it over a 4,000-year period, the Bible says God's standard has not fluctuated. In all of those passages we saw, in figurative and in literal language, God used the word nakedness to describe someone who is exposing some part of their body from the shoulders down the thighs to the knee. That's, you, you go in your Bible, and that's, that's what you're going to find. And so our clothing has got to conform to God's standard and not the world's standard. In Jeremiah's day, the Israelites were going into captivity. Jeremiah's day, the Jews were being taken captive by the Babylonians. And they were going to spend the next 70 years there because they had turned their backs on God. And one thing that Jeremiah said about them is that they had lost the ability to blush. Jeremiah 6, verse 15, Jeremiah 8, and verse 12. They lost the ability to blush. They were no longer embarrassed by what they should have been embarrassed by. Is it possible that here we are in South Florida and we're no longer embarrassed by the things that we should be as Christians embarrassed by? That we've allowed our society to dictate things to us. As we think about this subject, we need to recognize that the way that we dress can have an effect on others. And over the years, sometimes this is the only point that has been brought out in a subject like this.
Sometimes when, when a class has been had to teach, to teach teenage girls that they need to dress modestly, sometimes in those classes, the only thing that has been said in those classes is, okay, you need to dress modestly because the boys might lust after you, and so you need to dress modestly so that the boys don't, dress, so that the boys don't lust after you. Now, is it a possibility, that a likelihood, a probability more likely, to say when someone is dressing immodestly that is going to cause someone else to lust? Yes. Jesus said that, Matthew 5 and verse 28, that, that he would look upon a woman to lust for her. Well, why is he looking? What is he lusting after? He's seeing something that he wants. Sometimes in our dress or our undress, men see things that they want and it causes them to lust. I can remember teaching a teenage class on this subject uh, 24. Over 25 years ago, it was over on 36th Street. And I can remember that little teenage girl looking at me after we've talked about these things and talked about the fact that the way girls dress can cause a boy to lust. And I can remember her looking at me. I, I, boy, I can see her face. I could call her name, but I'm not going to. Here's what she said. She said, if I wear something that causes a boy to lust, that's his problem, not mine. I said, no, it's both of your problems. It's his problem because he has lusted, but it's your problem because you've led him down that road. See, God has created us as sexual beings. He's given us sexual desires and attractions, and those are absolutely normal. Men are typically more uh, easily stimulated by sight than women, which is why the swimsuit edition of Sports Illustrated was always the most popular issue, because men are stimulated. It's why the name of Hugh Hefner is a name that you know. Why do we know that name? It's the reason the porn industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's the reason that they use women who don't have themselves modestly clothed, but they use women who don't have much on at all to advertise and to sell various products because it gets attention. So sexual attraction is natural. It's something that's been created in us by God, but lust, hear it, lust is a choice. Sexual attraction, normal. But that has to be stopped before it reaches the level of lust. Lust is something that is a sin, and lust is something that must be controlled. And so I know I've heard ladies say, well, some guys are just going to lust after me no matter what I wear. I could wear a burqa, and they're still going to lust after me. Okay? True. Some guys are. But your responsibility is to make sure that you are not presenting yourself in a way that would be sexually appealing to another. If they lust after you, no matter what you're wearing, that's on them. You've done your part, though, if you are dressed modestly. It can cause somebody to stumble. Somebody says, well, that's their problem. They've stumbled. They shouldn't have looked where they look, right? But God's going to hold accountable the person who causes somebody else to stumble. The Bible says, Jesus says in Matthew chapter uh, 18, Verse 7, he says that offenses are going to come. People are going to come. People are going to stumble. But woe to them who cause the offenses. It's right after the verse in verse 6 where Jesus said, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. Ladies, what if the way that you dressed caused one of our young men to lust? Whoever causes one of these one, little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better if a millstone were hung about his leg and he was drowned in the depth of the sea. The way that we dress impacts others. It can cause them to lust. It can cause them to stumble. It can lead them to other sins. David lusted after Bathsheba. Was that the only sin that was involved in that story? No. More sins, and not just for David, but for both of them. And so as a Christian, our responsibility is to look out not only for our own interest, but to look out for the interest of others. Philippians 2 and verse 4. 
Go sometime over to the book of Song of Solomon and three times read that book and see God's, God's love for the, the human relationship between a husband and a wife. But three times in that book, God says, do not awaken, do not arouse or awaken love until it is time. Is it possible by the way that somebody dresses that it is arousing or awakening something in another person before it is time? Somebody says, oh, okay. So I just need to dress right for, so for everybody else, right? No. We need to dress right for God. I stopped short in 1 Peter 3 a minute ago on purpose because the end of verse 4 says, when I dress modestly, when I dress according to the hidden person of the heart that is professing godliness, God says that is very precious in the sight of God. What's most important is not what others think that is important, but what is most important is what God thinks. I need to dress in such a way that it is a reflection of the character that is within my heart that is professing godliness, that wants to first and foremost please my God, but also wants to not have a negative effect on others. Very quickly, let me share two more thoughts with you. Turn your Bible to Proverbs chapter 5. I want you to see this passage, and then we're going to add one more point to this. Look in Proverbs chapter 5. In the context of marriage... As we make this point, you see what's on the screen. There's a lot there. Our bodies should only be used to satisfy our husband or our wife. That's what the bodies were designed for, to be enjoyed inside of marriage. Look in Proverbs chapter 5, beginning in verse 15. Proverbs 5, verse 15, here's Solomon talking to his son. And he says, drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. He's not talking about H2O, okay? Get that out of your head. He's talking about man and woman. He's using figurative language. Go over and read the book of Song of Solomon, which is a commentary on this passage. He's using figurative language to say, buddy, you go and drink out of your own well. Don't go to somebody else's house. Don't go to somebody else's spouse. You stick to your own wife. Uh, should your fountains be dispersed to broad streams of water in the streets? Don't take what's yours and give it to other people. It's only between a husband and a wife. Verse 18. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife. The who? The wife. The who? The wife. This is in the context of a husband and a wife. Verse 19. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her. Who's your wife's love? We must save our bodies from view, people seeing it, from touch, and from enjoyment from everybody else that is not our husband or our wife. Only a husband is to be satisfied by seeing his wife's body. Parents and fathers, this is on us. This responsibility to teach and to train, this, this is on us. Parents and fathers, you are responsible to train your child in the way that he should go, to bring him up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, and to teach your child from childhood the holy scriptures that God has given to us. It's your responsibility. Parents, fathers, it's your responsibility to train them up to want to please God more than they want to please anybody else, to respect their bodies and to save their bodies for marriage, to flee youthful lust, as Paul told Timothy, to pursue righteousness, godliness, and holiness. It's your job to train them to develop a pure heart and to maintain a life of purity. It is your job to teach your children to dress modestly and to teach your sons to divert their eyes when others do not. Parents, fathers, it's our job. It's our responsibility. The world's not going to help us in this. It's our responsibility. So our job is to start young. You cannot start too early. 
You need in your young children to develop habits and rules and behaviors when they are little that you want them to have when they are older. If you want them to have these values, if you want them to abstain from certain situations, if you want them to dress a certain way, if you want them to hide certain parts of their body when they're older, you need to put that in them when they are younger. Well, David, they're just little and it's so cute. When are you going to draw the line between what's cute and what's immodest in the eyes of God? Start when they're young. Then you don't have to change the rules. Then you don't have to change what's modest or immodest in your house. Satan is going to do everything he can to war against your soul of your teenager. He's going to do everything he can. Why not get them ready before they get there? Why not equip them and have them ready to stand against the devil so that they don't have to question some things that's already been instilled in their little hearts from the very beginning? Dads, husbands, you've got to be a man. You've got to be a godly man. And it may not even be popular in your house, and the ladies in your house may not like it. You need to demand modesty of everyone who walks out of your house. Not because David says it, because God demands it. That every time somebody walks out of your house, they need to be dressed modestly. Guys, men, fathers, you know what guys are looking at because you struggle with it. You know what guys are looking at. Why do you want those guys gawking at your wife and your daughter the way that they gawk at those models? Demand modesty in your home. Sorry, I thought that was already on there. Demand modesty in your home. Strive to prevent sin and heartache and situations before they ever happen. For all I know, that may require some shopping trips this week to buy some new clothes. You won't spend money better than to make sure everybody in your house is modestly clothed. As we close, and I know those are your favorite words in any sermon. As we close, I want to ask you some questions. I know there are some of you who are sitting here who have been fighting against everything I've said. I know there are some of you who have been sitting here and been looking for loopholes in everything that's been said. I know that some of you are sitting here and saying, boy... This is the most naive person I've ever heard talk. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Why do we want to fight against what this book says? What are we trying to prove? What are we trying to accomplish? If David's off in anything that's been said today, don't take your complaints to the complaint department on the way home. If you've got some criticisms, you've got some disagreements, you've got some arguments, against, then bring them to the person who's been stating them this morning. And let's talk. Well, let me ask you some questions as we close. And this morning I want you to look into the mirror of your soul as you ask these questions. Before you go out of the house every day, you, I know you look in the mirror and you say, okay, how do I look today? Before you go out of the house every day, don't just look in that physical mirror, look in the mirror of your soul. And when you're standing there and looking in the mirror of your soul and you got your clothes on, ask these questions. Is what I am wearing modest, appropriate, and respectful by God's standards? Is what I am wearing too short, too low, too showy, too tight, too see-through, too revealing, or too provocative? When I go out, what body parts could be seen? when I move a certain way, when I sit down, when I bend over, when I reach, what might be exposed when I do that? If I go out today, am I going to spend time pulling down on certain parts of my clothes or pulling up on certain parts of my clothes just because they might start showing too much and I've got to pull them back? Is what I am wearing professing godliness and good works? Does what I am wearing promote and portray purity and holiness? Will what I am wearing hurt my influence for Jesus? Am I wearing this to draw attention to myself or to my body? Do my clothes 
draw attention to certain parts of my body that God actually wants me to cover? Am I showing anything that only my husband or my wife should see? Could the devil use what I am wearing for his purposes to tempt others? Will what I am wearing cause others to stumble or to lust after me? Will what I am wearing glorify God or glorify me and my body? And the last question to ask yourself as you look at yourself in the mirror of your soul, if I got to choose what to wear on judgment day when I stand before Jesus, would I want it to be this? The Bible says that it provides us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And it certainly does. It provides us even with what God wants us to wear. I have prayed more about this sermon over the last several weeks than I have prayed about many sermons in recent times. Because I know you don't want to hear this. I know there are some of you that have been shooting daggers at me all this while. I, I felt them. I felt every single one of them. But remember, it's not about David. I'm not up here to share my opinion. I found things in this study this last week I didn't even realize were in the Bible. And the more it came out, the more God's will became clear. I beg of you, to take what we've talked about today, to consider it, and where you need to, to make changes. As you think about your soul today, as we think about the matter of salvation, as that has been designed by God, can I ask you a question? Are you clothed? You got your clothes on? Are you clothed in Christ? Are you wearing Christ right now? Are you a Christian? The Bible says to be clothed in Christ that I need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I need to repent of my sins, confess my faith in Jesus, and I need to be baptized. Why would I need to be baptized? Because Galatians 3 and verse 27 says, that's when I put on my new clothes. That's when I put on Christ. If you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins, you are not clothed in Christ. At that moment, He'll wash away your sins, add you to His church, and Register your name in heaven. And he calls upon us in Romans chapter 13 to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and to make no provision for the flesh. To keep on walking with him. As you look at yourself in the mirror of your soul today, are you right with God? If you're not, why don't you get right right now as together we stand and sing.